So, and thank you for joining us the uh, community conversation today. It's great to have you all. Um, we have a really great presentation today, so we're going to move things pretty quickly. Um, you have two first-time hosts, so please be nice to us. Um, my name is uh, Miguel Drellas, and I am the Director of Community Animal Care uh, with Companions and Animals for Reform and Equity. Um, and I will pass it over to Geraldine to introduce herself. Thank you, Miguel. I'm so happy to be co-hosting with you today. It is our first time hosting uh, Maddie's Community Conversation, and I'm honored to do so. So my name is Geraldine De Silva, and I am a human and animal welfare consultant, and some of my key affiliations include Open Door Veterinary Collective, where I am Maddie's National Director of Programs and Partnerships, and I am also a mentor and strategic consultant with Project Street Vet. So um, today, uh, as we kick off uh, today's community conversation, I just wanted to encourage everyone to participate in the chat, use your voice, uh, unmute when appropriate. I remember way back when, when these calls started, I uh, was hesitant to use my voice, but uh, I did when the moment was right. And uh, here I am hosting these calls. So I highly encourage you to, to do it as well. So Miguel, if you want to talk about national updates. Are we doing the question of the day first? Great, okay. Uh, so in, like we said, we have a really great presentation today. And in the spirit of that presentation, we are going to, today's question of the day is what does safety net mean to you? Um, so go ahead and feel free to answer, respond in the chat. Um, and we'll, you know, hopefully have some time to also unmute folks if you'd like, but I'm going to keep the mic for a hot second um, and answer that myself just because my introduction to animal welfare was actually through volunteering uh, for a shelter intervention safety net type program. Um, and in my experience, it was really about listening to community to individuals um, and assessing needs and then really supporting those needs and supporting the decisions from that person that came with those needs. So sometimes it wasn't always what we wanted, but it was really important to continue to support that person in whatever it was that they were going through. So um, I'm gonna look in the chat to see what some folks have said. And also I think we're good on time. We really rushed through that. So if anybody wants to unmute, um, maybe one or two people. I see maintaining the human animal bond. Compassionate support without judgment for sure. Providing services to keep pets and owners together, hoarding food supplies. Yeah, all of those things. Cool. And we can definitely, um, yeah, thank you all so much for all your, for your responses. Keep putting them in the chat. Um, I'm sure there's more. Um, but we can move on to national updates. So if you have any national updates to share, um, now's the time. Feel free to unmute and share your updates. Um, reminder to keep them under a minute. Um, and you can also always share them in the chat uh, through links um, or messages. Hi, everybody. It's Kathy from Canada. Nice to see you, Geraldine. Welcome, Miguel. Um, just a note to let you know that the call for speakers for the 2025 Summit for Animals to be held in beautiful Montreal, Quebec um, at the end of April next year is now open and I'm going to pop the link in the chat. Thanks all.
All right. Any so other natural elements? I was just going to say, if we don't have any other ones, I'll pass it back over to you, Jogan. Awesome. And if there are any other national updates, feel free to add it in the chat. So without further ado, I am excited, really excited and honored to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, our guest speaker is Matt Pepper. He is the president and CEO of Michigan Humane. And uh, he has been with the organization for approximately 10 years and in animal welfare for about 20 years. And he has diverse and rich experience uh, as an animal cruelty investigator, as the director of animal care services and in various leadership roles. And he has an incredible and extraordinary team working behind the scenes, including people like Doug Plant, who I was happy to work with at some of the Haas working groups. And uh, Matt's insight today will include storytelling, measuring success, safety net programs, and the valuable role of social workers. So I'm proud to introduce Matt and Michigan Humane as a national leader in the evolving animal welfare model. And today's topic for our community conversation is keeping families and pets together with safety net programming. So over to you, Matt. Okay. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Geraldine. Let me pull up my presentation here. There we go. So first of all, Miguel, what a great question about what does safety net and community mean? And, and, and in my mind, what it means is equally valuing both ends of a leash in a way that maximizes the benefit that each party has on the other. And when we think about working in a community and keeping animals out of shelters and with their families and keeping families together and all the various programs that can do that, um, what, what we're talking about is people and working with, with people equally as much as we work with, with pets. So I'm really honored to be here today and chat about this. And I was offline just before I came here, I was sharing that I was, I was actually doing an interview with one of our local stations on a program we have tomorrow called Pictures of Hope. And it's with a, an organization here in Detroit called COTS, which is a, a human uh, shelter for people experiencing homelessness and our animal shelter. And what it is, is it will be 14 kids from that are right now living uh, in the shelter that are gonna be coming to our facility. They're gonna be gifted cameras and an award-winning photographer is gonna help them use their experiences to capture our animals and our work in a way that hopefully um, highlights the experiences they're having, but also the need for things like uh, safety net foster homes, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So for a long time, I have thought about animal welfare as, as, as an industry that is measuring things the wrong way. I think sometimes we confuse outputs for outcomes and we don't extrapolate out far enough the impact of our work. And I think that sells us short. And I'll, I'll, I'll start by where this, where this came to me. When I was uh, early on in my career, I was a responder to Hurricane Katrina and I was out there on the on the boats, uh, finding the dogs that unfortunately didn't make it out and the ones that, that did and helping some of the ones that we could. But I was in Tylertown, Mississippi. And a, and a gentleman is a young African-American man, uh, ripped up clothes, torn up. And every time he took a step, he had a little white dog in his hand, a little Shih Tzu. And every time he took a step, he would leave a bloody footprint. And he came up to us and wanted nothing, wanted nothing for him. He just wanted water and food for his dog. We offered him money, health. He didn't want anything. He just wanted food and, and water for his dog. But we asked him his story. And his story was he was he was living in one of the wards that were being flooded. And, and National Guard came by, knocked on the door and said, you need to get out of here right now. The floods of water is coming. We got to leave. And his answer was, OK, let me go get my dog. And as many of you know, all of you most on this call know, at that time, animals weren't really considered part of those evacuation plans. So when he, when he said no, he said, all right, well, hold on. I'll be right back. And he grabbed his dog and hid from the National Guard. And they left and, and he was he was there and hid and finally the waters rose and he ended up standing for three days on a hot tin roof in New Orleans sun holding his dog until someone rescued him. And I think about that experience all the time because that's a that's a life or death situation. And we know that people will sacrifice their own health and safety, but now extrapolate that out to the decisions we have to make every day for our pets and how our role impacts the human condition. Am I going to eat or is my dog going to eat? Am I going to take my medication or is my dog get my medication? And when I talk about measuring success, I often wonder if the, the, the problems being caused 
in, 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 in terms of the animal are not manifesting themselves in the animal. It might be manifesting self in human conditions, somebody not getting to work, somebody not taking their medication. And that's why I think we have to look at how do we measure success more holistically and how do we create healthier and safer communities through our work that impact the human condition that is ultimately better for, for the animal. So that was sort of how it, how it came about for me, but, but we also have a bunch of things happening at the same time. So what, so I, I always talk, we talk now about some of the challenges and adoptions that they've slowed down a bit, that we have animals that are really difficult to place, but we, we should pat ourselves on the back a little bit. A lot of that is because what we've done is work. You know, a lot of our preventative care has, has had an impact on shelter populations. A lot of our uh, shelter diversion programs are keeping pets in their homes. And, and not that we don't have dogs that, that, are, that are deserving of, of homes, but, but the typical family of four looking for their first pet probably isn't coming to my Detroit shelter right now. I've got mostly bully breeds with behavioral issues and medical issues, and they're great dogs. I've got two of them, but they're, they may not be what the first family is looking for. And shelter is expensive. It's expensive to open up these multi-million dollar buildings. So I am seeing, and we are focusing on sort of shifting to how do we, how do we not just measure success and look at the animals that are in the walls of our shelter, but how do we consider our impact on all of the animals in our community? and shifting to more retention and support in the communities. And as we get to the end, I'll talk about the business sense that we make for that, because philanthropically, it has a huge impact on our work. Uh, from an uh, expense perspective, it has impacted our work all positively. And I can share some of those insights that we've had. And for us, it sort of seemed like returning to our roots. So if, if any of you on this call are part of those, those older organizations that are you know, 150 plus so years old, you know that a lot of us didn't start adopting animals. Michigan Humane started helping horses, which at that time were anything from carriage to transportation and more, much more urban animals, and women and children, the subject of domestic violence. So the idea of returning back to our roots and coming back to the human condition is not a, a, a mission creep or a, a diverging from our mission. It's kind of going back to why we started. Um, and I just, I love to share this. This is a um, an annual report from, from Michigan Humane. At that time, it was just the Humane Society. We became Michigan Humane in uh, 1924 and just Michigan Humane in, in 2019. But this is our, uh, just the, you know, 130 women were assisted, 398 children, just all of the work that we did uh, impacting families in humans and not just the horses or the companion animals. It was uh, the families that were attached to them. So it really is um, a returning to our roots if, if you think about it that way. And things that we already know. I don't have to share with anyone in this room uh, the, 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 true, the truly scientific value of pets on our lives. That we know that there, there are physical benefits, we're more active, we're more connected, uh, we're, we're just healthier in general. And when we're outside connected walking dogs, as the police chief here in Detroit says, people aren't stealing cars. So we do create safer and healthier communities when pets are part of our lives and celebrated. As, as part of our lives and giving people that opportunity. So that's just kind of a foundational piece that we know that families are better with pets. And no matter how much money you have, you've likely got a pet. So let's figure out how we can support people in, in those conditions. As a matter of fact, I saw a really interesting study. I think it was the Pew Research Center who it basically talked about high income folks, medium income folks and low income folks and low income families considered their pet to be an equal member of their family at a higher percentage than anyone in medium income or, or higher income. And I also have to apologize. I'm at that age now where I can't tell, I can't see with my glasses and I can't see without them. So if I continue to take them on and off, that's what's happening. So I want to, I want to share a story because if we're going to be a community centered organization, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that we're an industry that is often, we do vilify poverty a lot. And we do um, look at somebody and say, you can't afford an animal, you shouldn't have one. And somebody who's a part of our services, they're not a, they're not a partner, they're, they're, a, they're a problem look, having to be solved. And we really had to look long and hard at how we were sharing our stories. All of us do this, all of us have the, you know, the, me standing in front of a line of cars and me telling, this is what we're doing for these people, helping them who can't, can't afford to care for their pets. So we started changing the way we tell a story. And why that's important is it, is it changed the way we engage with our community. So part of our rebranding process was to look at what's the, what's the message we're sharing. And if you think about animal welfare and sort of the Jungian archetypes, everyone is the hero. Everyone comes down, they swoop down and they save the dog and we're the hero. We um, intentionally got away from the hero archetype of sharing those stories 
and got more into the everyman, the, the, the orphan story, the one of, you know, if you think about famous characters that have that arc, it's Luke Skywalker and, and Harry Potter and all the people who said, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm strong, I'm doing something good, but I can't do it alone. I got to do it together. So we started looking at having people tell their own stories. And this is uh, Todd Anthony, one of my favorite people in the world. He comes to our pet food pantry and he is absolutely amazing. But this is sort of how we now start telling our stories by letting people have their own voice. And it's gotten us more ingrained in the community. But here we have uh, Todd Anthony. Now, oh, one of the reasons I share that story is, you know, I think when we think about him, man, that's the message we want people to have. Get a dog, love your dog, help your dog. Now that man, we had to put gas in his car while he was waiting for our pet food pantry because he didn't have money for gas. We, he slept in that car many times with his dog that he loves. That dog is his life. And so we tried to change how we share a story by, by um, really letting people tell their own story. And that's, that starts with really meeting people with where they are. And that's where I get into how do we start talking about safety net programs in the community as opposed to requiring people to come into the shelter, but how do we deliver things in a way that is meaningful to them? I'll tell you, there's many failures have gone into some of our successes and some of them are, you know, we would hold these adopt these uh, uh, shot clinic events and, and two thirds of people wouldn't show up. And then we'd leave and going, well, they must not care for their animal. Well, the reality is we were asking them to do it on a Tuesday in the middle of the afternoon when they probably had an hourly job and couldn't take off. So us trying to listen to the community and finding out more about what, what, what works for you? What are you actually looking for? And you know, a city like Detroit, for example, all of our different neighborhoods are wildly different in terms of what they need. So we look at each one individually. So let's, we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff we do, but I, I wanna share this story too. This is another one of one of my favorite people in the world as well as Todd Anthony. This is Cynthia. So I, I share her story because of this is a, this is an, a, an example of why keeping pets and meeting people where they are is so important because of what Cynthia had to go through, what she perceived she had to go through. Cynthia has one arm. She has no legs and one arm. And in that wheelchair you see right there, she wheeled herself across Detroit in late fall to get her food for her cats that are her entire life. She didn't have many family or friends that could take her anywhere. She didn't have a lot of connections. She didn't have a lot of um, very modest living, as you can tell. And, her, and this was during COVID. Now, how sort of I think we have to change how we look at these things are, yes, we provided all the regular services for the cats. We spayed and neutered them. We vaccinated them. We gave all the things that you would do for the seven cats that she had. But I, but I ask you not to think about that. Think about... Cynthia's life during COVID without the cats, if she would have had to surrender them because we weren't able to meet her where they were. We weren't able to uh, support her where she is. Um, I would, would, would go as far as to say, I doubt Cynthia would be here if it weren't for those cats and our ability to meet her. But she is just one of the, the sweetest people in the world. Talk about somebody who's been given nothing. And then when her cats jump on her lap, her life is, her life is happy and she's got everything she needs. So that's just an example of, again, those little decisions that people make that sacrifice their own health because of their pet. And it, and it shows up in a woman in a wheelchair across the size of across the city of Detroit. And to put Detroit in, in context, you can put Boston, Manhattan, and San Francisco in the geographic limits of Detroit. And she wheeled herself across that with one arm. So those are the decisions that people make every day. <coughs> Excuse me one second. So then we started really to think about, okay, we all of us are located. We have events in, in communities, but are we really a part of a community? So for example, our, our shelter in Detroit in the North End, which is just down the street for administrative offices, I would venture to say that 10, 10, 5, 10 years ago, uh, people would come from the suburbs to visit us, but people who lived right around the corner did not feel a part of our program. So how do we... How do we make ourselves a part of a community where we're valued and respected and, and, have, and, and allow people to have a voice? And we did that by, by listening. We held a number of um, 
of listening sessions where we didn't come with any any preconceived notions of this is what we're bringing, this is what we can do. It was um, it was what's important to you. And what's amazing is uh, the city of Detroit comes with us. It was it was some of the most well attended um, community listening sessions that they've had. And because people love their pets and everyone's on the same page, they wanted things like dog parks and safe pathways and, you know, more, more services in their community around animal, animal welfare, animal control, so that they can safely go, you know, to school and outside. We've had, unfortunately, we're in a city that's had five deaths by dog in the last two years. Um, so people are scared and we want to give them a voice and know what we can do to help support them. But this is where we started to listen. And we, we heard What's important to people is that we do sort of meet them where they are and meet their needs where they are and give them a voice in the work. So in order to do that, we changed our, our physical footprint. Now, in a time like this, when all of shelters are absolutely loaded with animals, um, you would be, it might surprise you to know that we closed two of our shelters. So we closed them because A, they were aging, and B, we recognized that we, there's more need than we can we can support in the community, but where can we have the most need? And so we reinvested into a community warehouse in Detroit. We reinvested into mobile veterinary units. Uh, we, we invested in social workers, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then community-based partnerships to help disseminate those services because, you know, um, getting getting food to people. I'll give you an example. You know, we know that there are human food pantries that know how to get food to people. Well, I know how to get pet food, so why don't I just partner with them? Because we know that about 70% of people have a pet anyways. Let's let's share our services and, and, and share our, our, our opportunities as well. Again, we talked about adding social workers. So we have uh, we have multiple MSWs on staff. Uh, my chief operating officer, Doug Plant, is an MSW by, by training, academics, and in, 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 in his work life. We have BSW and MSW students from Wayne State uh, and University of Michigan come here. And everyone that is external facing went through uh, Michigan two-on-one navigator training. And what that is, is um, and first, I think it's important to point out that when staff heard about this, they panicked. They thought we were asking them to be social workers. And what I we often say that 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 people go into animal welfare because they, you know, they don't like people, so they work with animals. We all know that that doesn't work anymore, but I never thought that was true. What I think is true is that we didn't like working with people problems because we didn't understand it or have an answer. So, you know, why do our vets struggle sometimes with people? Well, it's not because of what the animal needs. It's because that comes with, well, I lost my job and that's why I'm struggling to afford it. What can I afford here? Problems they don't have the answers to. And what we know in, in, in Metro Detroit and many communities is there are services to help just about everyone in, in, with some form of the impact of poverty on their lives. They just don't know how to reach them. So what our, what our navigator training is, is just in asking a second question. I'm giving you a bag of food for you to feed your dog. Um, are you struggling to feed yourself? Because the answer most likely is, is yes. And if the answer is yes, well then, then the, it goes, let me connect you to somebody who can help you. So at all of our events, one of our BSWs goes there and just spends all day talking to people and connecting them to other resources. Uh, our MSWs work in, his, in some of our more serious, if it's a hoarding case and somebody's kind of got to recognize uh, maybe the issues that, that they might they might be might be struggling with and, and aren't aware of it, or long-term care. I'll actually show you in action one of our MSWs working on just a, a fantastic story here in, in just a minute. But that's how we use our social workers. Uh, and this is a great example of um, we don't do anything alone anymore. Everything we do has to have a health and human service partner connected to it. Whether we're in a community, we'll bring another organization. The example of the, the photo shoot tomorrow with COTS bringing awareness to their need. Because every every family that stays in its home and doesn't have to go to a homeless shelter is one that can keep its pet. And so that's one that's not entering the shelter. But, but Gleaners is a great example. I'm sure all of us have been in one of those meetings where you, you uh, walk into a room and the person you're sitting across goes, I am meeting with you, looking at their watch. I am meeting with you because I was told I had to. I have no interest in working with animals. That is not what we do. I, I've had many of those meetings over the time. And the reason is because we're not, we're not measuring success the same name. We're not speaking their language. We're speaking our language. Um, the, the mayor of Detroit doesn't care what my live release rate is or how many adoptions I have. He cares what I'm doing to make sure the next, the sixth kid doesn't die in his backyard. He cares about the, the, the dogs that are running loose around the time when school's getting back in. He cares about those factors. Uh, the CEO for Gleaners 
was impact was 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 what was important to him was feeding families. So then we did some research and we we started um, asking his clients, "Do you have a pet? And have you ever sacrificed a meal for your pet?" And the answer was, depending on the event we were at, fifty to seventy percent of the time, the answer was, "I'm getting human food from gleaners and I'm giving it to my dog or my cat." And so, as you can imagine, now that I'm speaking his language, hey, that now you're telling me that without you, my food isn't going to its intended purpose about two thirds of the time. Now I'm listening. And that that turned into a much broader partnership that now has us co-housed in their 26,000 square foot warehouse. Um, we are, we're now, we went, when I first started, I'll be here 10 years in, in, in two weeks. When I first started, we were distributing about 36,000 pounds of pet food a year. And that was because somebody walked up and said, I need some extra food, do you have some? Uh, last year, we did 1.6 million pounds of food to 9,000 families. This year, we're going to distribute 2.3 to 2.5 million pounds to 12,000 families through 15 to 20 different distribution sites in targeted areas in Detroit. And those are families that are, and we're, we're distributing through the Gleaners model, through their human food pantries. And what's interesting is that we, we everything we do too, we ask just three simple questions and it can be different questions. We just know that if we ask too many, we lose it. And they're simple questions. But one of the questions we asked was, when they picked up pet food, we asked them, have you, you know, are you, are you at a human food pantry distribution for the first time? And 32% of the time at our last event, um, they said, yes, the pet food was driving them to a human food pantry that they didn't know they had access to, which is creating, which is solving a bigger problem. These are just some of, and, and, and from an animal welfare perspective, we should think of these as, as selfish opportunities. So we, at a recent event, we had 92% of them said that the free pet was one of the primary reasons they kept their pet in their home. 67%, I mean, this is just information we got else was that barrier, cost is a barrier in receiving care. And 82% said our low cost vaccine clinics help keep their pets in their home. So if you combine those two, 82 to 92% of 12,000 families with some of that multiple dogs, that's a lot of animals not entering our shelters. And with the second question of how do we help stabilize the family unit? What else is happening that we can connect you to? Um, another great example is in our call center. Our call center takes about a, a quarter million calls a year. And we know, everyone knows the connection between domestic violence and animal welfare and animal cruelty. Um, multiple occasions, somebody has called to make a veterinary appointment. And because we know to ask that second question now, hey, you, you don't sound like something's right. Are you okay? Uh, I can I can think of about five situations in the last year where so the answer was no, but I don't know where to go for help. My husband hurt my dog, but I don't know where to go. Can you help me? We get the dog in, connect them to a domestic violence shelter, and everyone is safer, including that pet. So what is what does safety net programs look like for um, for us? I think sometimes we think about them only as you know uh, our foster programs. A lot of us have those, you know, for for people who need. Uh, fostering immediately for some sort of life event, but it's really everything combined. It's every, what we think about it as everything that happens outside the walls of our shelter is a form of intervention and safety net programming. So it's our pet food pantry. Again, 12,000 families, 2.5 million uh, pounds of food, our health and human service referrals. We regularly refer to 50 or more health and human service organizations, our clients for additional support services. It's our social workers who can help people uh, connect to other um, other services that can help stabilize the family unit. Uh, our community clinics, because at the end of the day, it, uh, Detroit is a true veterinary desert. More than 50% of people in Detroit don't have access to regular transportation, which means that if I make them go anywhere, they won't be able to get to it. 20% of Detroiters make less than $10,000. So it's a really challenging environment for people to get to us. So we now do, uh, we have a mobile vet unit for people who are homebound, our veterinarian. And we send one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Cece, who is the 2021 Association of Shelter Vets, uh, Shelter Vet of the Year. So we send, not only do we send you a vet, we send you one of the best in the country to go to your home. Uh, we do that about 200 to 300 times a year. We hold pop-up clinics, which is where we'll go into um, some, some uh, challenged neighborhoods, just get to a corner pull up our tent and say, if you got a dog, come on in and 25 to 30 families will come up and get their shots. And then we do larger events where we'll see 200, 300, 400, up to a thousand people walk through um, our lines. It's again, those are mobile veteran one health events. And when I say one health events, what I mean is really the collaborative events. So we will host, you know, uh, dental cleanings at discounted rates at our, at our shelters. 
And then what we will do is bring uh, the, the University of Detroit Mercy's mobile dental unit with us. So you can get your dog's teeth looked at while you walk over and get your teeth done. At, during COVID, we would bring the health department. Get your dog, your dog, your cat's vaccines while you go over and get talk to somebody about vaccines. We have uh, DT Energy who has a uh, utility assistance who's at all of our events to help look at how can we help you, you know, you're trouble, you're in trouble keeping the lights on. Let's see what we can do for that. And then our veterinary clinic discount. So we know that the value of all of that is about $38 million by 2030, we anticipate giving away as, as a value of, of all the services. But we do about a million dollars just in Detroit alone of discounted veterinary services. Um, Detroit, as an example, is a city of about 650,000 people. There you, we, we, I already went over the geographic area. There's only 12 veterinary clinics in the entire city and, and, and we are the largest. So even if you wanted to receive veterinary care as a Detroit resident, where would you go if you couldn't get somewhere? So we're really the primary provider for many people. But as an example, I'll use our, um, our safety net foster program. And I, and I use this uh, because it's a, it's a visible one. It's one that's replicatable. It is, you know, whenever we measure programs, we always look at impert, impact versus effort. I put everything on a, on a spectrum. This is a individually very high impact program with relatively low costs associated with it. Um, our safety net foster program right now has had 51, um, 51 pets go through it. 68% of those were people who are experiencing homelessness or pending eviction. 11% were victims of domestic violence. 11% were those who needed major medical treatment and didn't know where to go. And I'll touch on that last one in just a minute. When I say safety net foster, I'm sure everyone knows what that means, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, that's somebody who calls us and said, I'm having a major life issue, and I, but I don't want to surrender my pet, but the place I'm going won't take my pet. Um, and we have families who stand up to support those pets for 30, 60, 90 days, and then return them back to the family. The reality is uh, a good percentage of them end up being surrendered ultimately, but most of them go home, go back home where they're loved, where they need to be. And the medical rehabilitation one is interesting. We did a study with Dr. Tiffany Braley at University of Michigan, Michigan Medicine. And um, she, she, she was asking people, what impact do pets have on you receiving medical treatment? And this is where when I get to um, talking the same language as people, funders, things, big ideas, this is where I think we need to shift the way we talk about things. Michigan Medicine found that uh, about, about two thirds of people that were that were that have pending major medical treatment, one of the primary concerns is, I don't know what to do with my pet while I'm gone. What am I gonna, so I'm, I'm gonna delay it. But a third of the people did in fact, significantly delay major medical treatment because they didn't know what to do with their pet or know where to turn, someone could watch it. And 19% of people in this study directly left against the doctor's orders because they had to get back to their pet that was at their home. So what does that tell me? That tells me that when I look to funders to fund programs like a safety net foster program, I don't lead with it helps keep the dog out of the shelter. I lead with it helps um, get uh, abused uh, uh, people out of domestic violence situations. It help gets makes sure people get major medical treatment that wouldn't otherwise get it. And it helps support families who are uh, facing eviction or, or, or homelessness. And the, we talk about it in that way and the react, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about just quickly about the impact on our philanthropy, that shift in our, in, our, in our narrative to the human element of our work has dramatically impacted, impacted our relevancy to funders in the community in, in, as a whole. And so the next one I'm gonna share is, a, is a, a great story. You might have to turn your volumes up a little bit. James is a really low, he speaks very lowly. So this is a, a safety net foster program, James, in this case, it's James and Willow. You're looking at Willow right now. James was a self-admitted 51-year heroin addict. Now, first of all, how you live that long as a heroin addict, I, I don't know. But he had finally decided that um, he was leaving his, his girlfriend, who he had for a long time. She was enabling him. She continued to do drugs. He said, I'm going to go get clean. He finally, after 51 years of, of being on heroin, went into a, a rehab center she took his cat and then said, I'm not, if, you, if you're doing this, then I'm leaving you and, and left, his, left his cat. And in order for him to get treatment, somebody had to care for that cat. So we, we came in and our, our safety net foster team uh, picked up his cat, put him to a home while he was there for 90 days. Uh, now, the, the sad part of the story is shortly after this video, James died. He died two weeks later after this, after this video was placed. Willow was placed into another loving home. But what's important is that he didn't die alone. And that might've been the only thing, he died clean and he didn't die alone. And what's, what's important about this video is there's a part in here 
that um, he, one of our team says we needed a win. That's Maggie, our, our, our social worker, who's now going to get her PhD at Loyola. So we're looking for a new one right now. But she, she, um, she said, we needed a win. And he very softly says, am I a win? As he's crying through his tears. And why I share that with you is considering the human element, making sure he didn't have to give up this cat. He could live with this cat. He had something that meant something to him. Might have been the first time somebody treated him with respect in his entire life. So I love sharing this video. And while it's a sad ending, ultimately, we have to remember he died um, after taking taking in this. Pro uh, after he died. I didn't die alone. So let's share uh, James and Willow's story. And I, oh, and I, I share that, oh, well, I, sh I share that video, you know, it, obviously it didn't end like we'd like, but that's, that's how, that's the consideration of the human element and telling those stories. That's a man who would have never gotten clean had it not been for somewhere to hold his cat. That's a man who needed to be treated with respect. And I'm sure as an animal control officer in my past, I'm sure that I was what I would consider right now, one of the biggest problems. I'll bet you, I would have looked at that man 10, 15 years ago and thought he was a problem and shouldn't have this cat. And now I, I think about it as I can't imagine his life without that cat, however short it was after they were reunited. And Willow is living happy, happy and healthy with a, with a new family. But the story isn't even about the cat. It's about the person behind the cat. So let's talk now about the, the business sense of why shifting into the community, why changing your narrative, why starting to measure success on the human element um, makes sense. So here's just some of the, we sh when we rebranded and decided we are really gonna shift and go full force into the community. If I think about it, too often times we only measure success based on the animals that enter our shelter. How many adoptions did I have? What's my intake? What's my live release rate? Not all the other impacts we have that are equally as important. So if I look at 2012, that 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 blue no, that blue line in the middle is the number of animals that were entering our shelter. If the 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 brown one is the number of animals we were impacting in our community, and the reality is most of that was through cruelty investigations and rescue our Animal Cops Detroit team that was on Animal Planet for a long time. And by 2019, the green number is the total number of animals. We were impacting 15,000 animals, or at least you know, about 15,000 animals less. Our relevancy was, was being limited by our, our how we were measuring success. And now as we, as we started to look at really shifting into impacting more animals in the community and preventing them, you see that we are impacting more animals than we were before, in a much more positive way and sharing those stories. And we're, and we're relating more to the funders and the community. So it also, I'll go to that one in just a minute, but there's there's more of a business case in, in how much it costs to care. We know that shelters are important. Any person who walks in my door and I do, we, we have a great finance team. Anybody who walks in my door and says, I need help, I need major surgery, I need behavioral support, I need food. You know, if we give them everything we have to keep that pet in the home, it's about $684. Once a dog or a cat walks in our door and it becomes ours, I got to keep the lights on. I got to staff it. It's a minimum $1,200 before I do much for it. So there's a business case. Your dollar goes twice as far when working in the community. And um, philanthropists see that. So this is just a two-year version of what had happened since we really started um uh, really digging in and leaning into this, this human element in our work and, and talking about our pillars. Our pillars now are healthy communities, safe neighborhoods, and a thriving economy. And everything we do has to impact one of those three pillars. I use an example. Why do we do adoptions? Well, it's great for the dog and it's great for the family, but we also know that you're 31% more, li more likely to be uh, uh, active with a pet. Uh, the issues, we all know the issues about blood pressure and, and heart health with a pet. Um, if you're outside walking your dog, your communities are safer, you're more connected. That's why we do them. And that impact has changed our relevancy to the funders, but primarily in a couple major major areas. If you look at the major gifts line, which is the, the green, those are people who want big ideas. And big ideas are changing people's lives. 
you know, big, big adoptions are fantastic. And I don't want to sound like I'm against them. Obviously, I would love to do more. But we're really talking about fundamentally changing people's lives. And we, when I talk about measuring success, what I mean is we used to tell a story this way. A dog would come in broken. We would fix it. It would be adopted. And that would be the end of the story. What I think we should be thinking about is that is the beginning of the story. People know you do all the work for the animals. Show that. But then try to focus on what has fundamentally happened differently in that in the life of that family. Are they more active? Are the kids more stable? Are they having uh, fewer issues? Is the family generally healthier and safer? Those are the things that I think we need to look at. But the other area that we saw growth in uh, was uh, corporations and foundations. Because what we were finding was that a lot of corporations would walk up and go, I don't, I don't do animals. I do, I do peoples. So we had to figure out how does our work impact people? So a great example would be uh, the, Detroit, the Detroit Children's Hospital Foundation. I met with their uh, previous CEO and his first answer was, before we even get started, I just want you to know, we don't, we don't fund like animals. I said, well, you're great, but you do fund things that impact children's health, right? And 80% of dog bites in the city of Detroit occur in a home to a child's face or hands because the dog is either unsocialized or, or medically in, or, or unhealthy. And our work in the community providing uh, healthier pets creates safer environments for children. And the immediate answer was, well, that makes perfect sense. Here's your money. So changing the way we talk and, and, and fitting it into what's important to the broader community uh, has made a huge impact on our, on our life. And this is just an example of, um, when we talk about, you know, when I first started really heavily digging into social workers and community work and closing shelters, we had some people who thought our donors were going to consider it mission creep. We were we were going to be cutting out the uh, the you know the little old lady that donates to us every month and loves the dogs. The reality was that has been um, far from the truth. This is just a quick letter from a from a don donor who wrote us, and this is a, we have thirty five to forty thousand individual donors every year. This is indicative of of almost all of them. You know, it's it's sure it sure is nice to, to to know that you donate. What I donate is helping our furry friends. I have two Yorkshire Terriers. I am able to afford all the care that they need, but I often think about what would happen if I couldn't. So people are empathetic to what we are trying to do, which is provide healthier, more stable environments for families. And so the impact in our our operation as a whole of really shifting into the community, really leaning into. Um, social workers, uh, metrics that impact human health conditions and safety measures are that we, we A, are significantly more effective in the community, keeping families together. We're keeping animals out of the shelter. Um, we are working significantly further upstream of issues. I mean, we all know sort of the general philosophy is that once somebody walks in your door with their dog to surrender it, it's hard to change their mind. Uh, we are getting farther upstream and impacting more issues that are creating instability in the lives of families and their pets. Um, it is driving much more systemic change because you're giving people the opportunity to have different experiences with animal welfare organizations, but also with their pets. Uh, we're developing true relationships in the community. I mean, the fact that I know Todd Anthony and I know Cynthia, I knew James, um, I know those people. Like those are those are real people. And I think too often times we think of them as a problem that needs to be solved when in fact they're partners in this work in the community. And then and then it builds advocates. Uh, you heard you heard Todd, Todd Anthony is the greatest example. Get yourself a dog. You don't have to be alone. Dogs are therapy. He is he is preaching uh, uh, preaching to the choir in his community about about our work and what we do. And in uh, in another just a great story on how working in the community has changed our relevancy. About probably eight months ago, we had a 17 year old single mother call us and say they they needed help. They were kicked out of their house. They didn't know where to go. So Maggie, the same woman from the James and Willow story, got in her car, drove over, picked her up, drove her to a shelter, got her set up, spent about four hours with her, getting her, you know, set up with a potential, you know, for some some employment out help, some some uh, place for her and her and her daughter. And what I love about it is she didn't have a pet. She only called us because one of our people that we've been supporting in the pet food pantry said, you know what, call Michigan Humane, they'll help you. No matter what you need, they'll help you. Now. Do I want us? Are we in the in the in the world of of doing that often? Not really. We don't do that level of of, of social work often. But I, but it's changed our relevancy to the community. They now see us as a partner and being a part of the community, as opposed to just being an organization who's in the community. Now I will say too, there's much more need than we're able to address. And you know, we get a, a lot of criticism of why aren't you doing more? Well, we're we're doing the most that we can. That's what we've decided that we can we can shift our work. So. 
I am happy to answer any any questions anyone might have. And uh, I think I might have I've rushed it a bit. I'm pretty good done time. I think I did it about right. So happy. You did fantastic. Matter of fact, how we live it. There's our better together sign. So. Yeah, that was insp inspirational. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm going to hand it over to Miguel so he can now get into the questions because we have. I always tell people if they're hard questions. I'll get someone to answer them. I'll take the easy ones. We have quite a few questions, so we're definitely not going to get through all of them. But of course, you can always continue the conversation on Maddie's forum. Uh, so I'll start off with I'm going to work backwards a little bit. What's the percentage of those who do not surrender because of the services that you're able to provide? So, uh, so I can tell you that it roughly um, in most of our studies, when we, we ask them, how is this question keeping your pet in your home? The answer is typically between 70 and 90%. We'll say that I'm not surrendering my pet because of the service. Now, how many people are, you've got a, one way down, one way the other, but I would argue that when we when we um, survey people, it is overwhelmingly two thirds to three quarters, at least I would argue, are saying that this is the primary reason they're not surrendering their pet. Um, but there also isn't one single service. Usually the people in our pet food pantry are getting some shots from one of our clinics who might have needed some reactive care. So it's it's a combination of everything that 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 we do to help keep families together, but it, it is a it is a majority of those families. I'm, and, the, and the result of that actually is positive on the animals that enter the shelter because it's allowed us to reduce our population. 10 years ago, we took 37,000 animals. Last year, we took 8,800 because of these programs, keeping them out. And that allows our team to do more for the ones that are in the shelter. Thank you. Move right I put on. my email in the, in the thing too. If anyone has a question we didn't get to, I think I put it in there. I did. If I didn't, I will. I'll move on to another question. Um, this was, we struggled to receive responses to our post vaccine slash food distribution surveys. What steps have you put in place to receive more responses? Uh, are you talking, is the question, how do I get those answers from people? I'm not sure if- Well, uh, I, so I can tell you what we've yeah, done is more dramatically simplified it. It is three very, we, we'll ask, you know, is this your first time to a food shelter? How many pets do you have? Is, is this food helping keep your pet in your home? And it's, it's or, you know, we might ask, what are, what are, give, give me, we might even ask just one question. Give me three other needs that you are struggling with, with in, in your family. And then we know who to partner with. If we get, you know, 75% of people are going to say food, uh, shelter, and utilities. That's what I know is the answer. So then I know that I need to find partnerships with human food pantries, uh, DT Energy to help with power issues and, and uh, domestic violence or any type of shelter for people who might be experiencing homelessness. Thank you. And I think we have time for just one more quick one. Let's see. It was uh, the first one. Where do you get the food that you pro provide from and how do you fund that? Yeah, I can tell you, um, we, we got dinged in our last financial audit because we never were used to holding so much food and food has an IRS value of about two and a half dollars a pound. And now that we're keeping a couple million pounds, uh, we weren't, we weren't, we had to learn how to file our paperwork differently. We get ours through a variety of sources. Uh, number one, we work very extensively with greater good charities. And we also do that because we have the infrastructure. So they work with us distributing a lot of food because we don't just keep it. Once a week, we have more than 50 partners in animal welfare who come up and we distribute food to them for them to distribute in the thing because we have a great um, warehouse for that. We also get food from uh, local um, food insecurity organizations who never thought when they closed out a store of asking for pet food. So that's been a real source of food for us. If you can develop a relationship with a lo local Amazon distributor, how much food they throw away is amazing. And then uh, we get a little bit from Purina, a little bit from our relationships with PetSmart and some other ones. Uh, the result of all of that and piecing it together is we don't pay a dollar for the food that goes to our pet food pantry. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll let Geraldine finish this off and I'll just Quick reminder that um, if we didn't get to your question or if you want to continue the conversation, please go to Maddie's forum. 
Yes. So I just wanted to say thanks again, Matt. We knew it was going to be inspirational, but the chat was very active. Everyone was engaged. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And like Miguel said, we'll continue the conversation on Maddie's Pet Forum. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.